morning, church. Why don't we stand? Let's jump into worship here. Come, now is the time to worship. everybody. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 107, starting in verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry he fills with good things. Whoever is wise... Let them attend to these things. Let them consider 
the steadfast love of the Lord. Let's worship together now. I just want to invite you to uh, pray now. To We're going to take a moment here. We're going to lift our, our needs and our, our concerns, um, our requests to the Lord in prayer because we actually believe he actually hears us and that he has brought us to himself. He's brought us into a relationship like that where he hears us because Jesus has made that way. Jesus has lived in our place and died in our place and has been raised from the dead to actually connect us to God so that we can come to him in an ordinary room and actually lift our concerns to him and expect him to hear and to answer from heaven with power. So we're going to pray. After we pray, we're going to uh, pass the offering and, and, uh, and worship again. Uh, and after, you know, after a verse or so of, of that song and after the bags have had a chance to get passed, we'd invite you to stand and, and worship in singing with us. But let's pray now together. Our Father in God, we're going to uh, come to you in a few moments and sit under uh, your word. And that word is going to speak to us about our mouths, about our words, about the way we use our tongues. And so, Lord, we pray that we would be prepared in our hearts to receive that word, and we would we would give a thought to how we've used our words this week. Maybe how we've used our words over many years and the pattern we've set in our lives for our words. Think about maybe how we intend to use our words and what they're for. We confess, if we're being honest, that we have not always used our words to bless and to build but rather to tear down and destroy and hurt. And Lord, I'm not talking about vulgar words only. I'm talking about just even refined words that are not designed to bring strength and life and comfort and truth to the lives of others. Uh, Lord, this was not the purpose of our words um, to, to tear others down, but rather to to build up, and so we pray that your word would strike us where we need to be struck, but also comfort us where we need to be comforted, and that uh, it would turn our hearts to the gospel, and so that we would know where to go with our guilt, and we'd know where to go with our regret, and we'd know who can carry that guilt away. Lord, we praise you for Christ, the word made flesh, your word made flesh. And Lord, this is a mystery beyond our ability to fully explain with our words, but Christ is the way you have made yourself known. He's the way you spoke to us. He's your word. And so we pray with thanksgiving for Christ, the word, meeting us in our guilt, meeting us even though our mouths are full of all kinds of impurity and destruction and fire. We thank you that Christ came not with fire, but came to bear the cross in our place. Lord, we thank you for the church body you've given us. I thank you in particular for the many volunteers who actually make this thing work. Um, I thank you for the volunteers that work with our children especially. I thank you for our teachers and helpers in the kitchen on Discovery Zone nights. I thank you for the committed nursery volunteers and, and uh, the children's church volunteers uh, that are, are going to be starting up again soon. Thank you for their heart to see our children spiritually formed and cared for. Thank you for our Sunday school teachers, our youth group volunteers, all of the people that work at even getting the various events for children throughout the, throughout the calendar year uh, pulled off and arranged. Uh, Lord, they don't get paid. Sometimes they don't get thanked the way they should, and so we thank you now for them. We thank you for your spirit in them. We thank you for your hand in their ministry. We thank you for the fruit that you have produced uh, by their efforts, and we pray for them to increase in gratitude to the glory of God. 
Oh, Lord, we pray for this event we've got coming up on Saturday. We pray that it's an encouragement to people. We've got people coming from other towns for this, and so we pray that they would be coming and they would be built up and they would be sent back to their churches and back to their towns to be a blessing where they go. I pray that there be people, that there be children at this event on Saturday that that would, maybe even if they've heard the gospel and known the gospel before, pray that they really hear it for the first time and decide to turn their lives over uh, to Jesus, to realize that maybe their knowledge of Jesus before was just head knowledge and, and it needs to be true heart knowledge. Lord, as we think about teaching, as we think about instruction, as we think about hard workers, I can't help but think about teachers. I uh, think about the teachers in our schools in the Yankton community. I thank you so much for, for your people that are, that are planted all over the school district and are working out your purposes in those schools and in those offices and in those buildings. I thank you for them, and I pray that you would strengthen them to be a witness where they're at. I thank you for their daily efforts, not only to, not only to educate the next generation, but also to be an example of Christian love and wisdom in a very unloving and in a very unwise time. Thank you for them. Strengthen them and give them a powerful witness where they are at. Lord, I think also of the many homeschooling families and the, and the, and the crew at uh, Missouri Valley Christian Academy. Thank you for them and their efforts to our children. And pray that that effort would bear fruit, not only in the lives of those kids, but in the cultures that they uh, grow up in. I pray that you'd keep them from depending on education for righteousness. Keep them depending on Christ alone. Keep them thankful and winsome and full of love and good deeds. Lord, we're going to continue to worship now by giving a little bit of what you have given to us. And I pray that that's what it would be, that it would be worshipful, that it would be us just loving how gracious and how generous you've been with us. Lord, I pray that our guests would not feel a pressure to give from us, but would rather feel like they are welcome guests in our gathering today. And I pray that those of us who have made this church our home, I pray that we would give with a spirit of gratitude and gladness and excitement and expectation for what you will do with the resources you have given us. And this I pray in Jesus' name. So the ushers are going to pass the offering now. And after a moment or two of passing the offering, I'd invite you to join us in worship. All right. At this point, any kids that want to come forward for the children's sermon can come forward. You guys get me today. All right. Hey there. I actually need you to sit right down there, not next to me. Otherwise, you're going to miss out on lots of cool stuff. Okay. All right. How's everybody doing? Man, look at this crew. Holy cow. All right. All right. I want to show you guys something. Who could tell me what that is? What? Is, it's a mouth. Yes. It's kind of hideous looking, isn't it? I got the tongue hanging out there. Looks like he's maybe got some of his lunch left on his tongue. I don't know. Anyway, so... Tell me, somebody tell me uh, what we do with this thing. We, what do we do with a mouth, uh, Nathaniel? We talk a lot. Yep, we talk a lot. And we eat stuff. That's my favorite thing to do with my mouth is eat stuff. Jackson, we brush our teeth. We stick, we stick stuff in there. And we actually pay hundreds of dollars for a total stranger to stick their fingers in our mouth, too, every six months just to make sure we don't have cavities. I know. It's crazy. Now, one more thing. Yeah, little kids sometimes use them to bite people. Yeah. Okay, so that's what we do with our mouth. Yeah. 
Yes, I know. Okay, so we do all kinds of things with our mouths, and God created it as a good thing. We do lots of good things with our mouth. But, you know, one thing Pastor Brandon is going to talk about today in our sermon time is some of the bad things we do with our mouth. We can also do bad things with it that God calls sin. And those things that we sometimes do with our mouths hurt our relationship not only with others, but also with God. And so, you probably know what I'm talking about and have experienced this, right? Many times, we can use our mouths to say things that are not good to say. And I'm not simply talking about bad words here when I say this. What I'm really talking about is any time we use any kind of words that are designed to hurt somebody rather than to do good to them. That's one of the big ways we commit sin with our mouths or our tongues, as you're going to hear in James 3 today. But kids, it gets worse than this. It actually gets worse than this. Here's what happens sometimes. Sometimes we will get in trouble for the bad things that we say in all the sinful ways we use our mouths. And then, rather than using our mouths to admit that we were wrong, we will use our mouths to try and get out of trouble in a dishonest way. Sometimes, if we get caught saying something that we shouldn't, we will often use our mouths, and we might say something like this, well, I didn't mean it. Or we'll say something like, well, you didn't really understand what I meant. These are some fancy ways adults try to get out of trouble for what they say. Or we'll say, I was just being honest when I try to say something hurtful. Now, those are some of the ways we get out, try to get out from under the trouble we get into with our mouths. But here's what I want you to remember. Jesus himself explained to his disciples one day that those are all just lame excuses for what comes out of our mouths. Jesus himself said that everything we say with our mouths actually comes from deep within our hearts. Yeah, it comes from deep within our hearts. So, our hearts really are the explanation. Did you see the heart? I know, it doesn't, I ruined the surprise, didn't I? So, Jesus says that what comes out of our mouths originally comes from our hearts. He says it this way in Matthew 15. He says, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. This makes them unpure. Okay, so it's what Jesus says, and that means it's true. We have to be honest about why we say what we say. It comes from our hearts. So I want you to think about it this way. I've got this water bottle here, okay? And this is the water bottle I've been drinking on, off and on, uh, this morning. And I'm going to ask you a question about it. Still cold. All right, I want to ask you a question about it. Now, my kids have maybe heard me explain this before, so I'm going to ask my kids to let somebody else answer if they, uh, if they already know the answer. But I'm going to do something here. All right, so what did I just do? I dumped water in the bowl. I didn't. If some people in the back row might be worried. I landed in the bowl, okay? It's not on the carpet. All right, so I'm pouring the water out in the bowl. Ella Bella, you sit down on the floor. So, now I want to ask you a question. Why did the water come out of the bottle? Oh, because there's a hole, right, called, a, kind of, kind of, kind of called the mouth of the bottle, right? And it, uh, it came out because there's a hole in the bottle. Are there any other reasons you can think of for why the water came out of the bottle, Abigail? Because gravity. gravity, right? Because gravity, because I poured it upside down and gravity, right, yeah. That's one reason. One more reason you can think of for why it came out of the bottle. Jackson, do you have an idea? Because I dumped it out. Those are all very good explanations for why water came out of the bottle. I took the lid off. Gravity works a certain way. So when I tipped it, and well, thankfully, the bowl does not have a hole in it. That's a good thing. So nobody has to clean this up later except me. So, yeah. Okay, now I'm going to ask you the question a different way. And maybe somebody else, when they, when they, when they want to answer it, well, can raise their hand and tell me. And uh, here's the question a different way. Why did water come out of the bottle? 
Abigail? Because water was in it. That's why water came out of the bottle. The only thing that could have come out of the bottle is what was in it. All right? Only what comes out of this bottle is what was already in the bottle. Okay, guys, here's the point. Our hearts are the same way. What comes out of your mouth comes from what's already in your heart. So we don't really have an excuse for when we say things that God isn't pleased with and that are designed to hurt others. You know, when it comes out of our mouth, it's because we did mean it. It's because it was in our hearts, okay? The hurtful things that come from our mouths come from our hearts, and so we can't get out of trouble by saying that there's some other reason for why that came out of our mouth. But you know what we can do? We can be honest. We can be honest with Jesus about the sin in our hearts, and we can ask him to take it away. You know, he died. He died for the sins of our mouths, and he died and then he was raised from the dead, right? So that our sins could be punished and stay in the grave. And then he came out of the grave so that we can believe in him with our hearts and confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. And he can give us a new heart. You know, kids, I wasn't that much older than you when somebody explained this to me. And I think they'd explained it to me lots of times, but I was around your, some of your ages when I heard it for the first time. I mean, really heard it. Yeah. And so I'm going to pray for you now that maybe one of you or maybe all of you might have one of those kind of moments like I had when I was your age, and that you'd have ears for this good news, that Jesus died so our sins can be taken away, and we can all actually be forgiven and live with him forever. So let me pray for you, and then I'm going to give you uh, bulletins on the way back to your parents, okay? Father and God, I thank you for Jesus and that he took our sin away by his death on the cross. And I pray that each of us would be honest about the content of our hearts and that we would entrust Jesus to be our sacrifice and carry it away forever so that we could live with you in peace and gladness and forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Right. Happy Lord's Day, everyone. It's good to be here with you again. Um, I, don't know, I feel compelled uh, to maybe share this. Uh, a few weeks ago, I said to my Wednesday night class how Hanging out with them was one of the funnest things, one of the highlights of my week. And uh, one of the students was actually like, really? <laughs> it's like, yes, I, I actually find a lot of joy and pleasure from gathering and teaching and, and spending time with you guys. And uh, this morning as well, um, I said the same thing to my, my Sunday school class, which is, man, you know, I, I could literally lay over in this couch right now and fall asleep. I'm tired. I don't know if you guys are ever tired on a Sunday morning, but I'm, I'm tired. But it's just such a blessing uh, to gather with God's people and, and look at his word. And very consistently, uh, Sunday is, is just the absolute best day of my week because I get to gather here. I get to sit under good preaching of God's word. And, and for me, by the time I leave, um, I typically just feel this sort of calm kind of peace and, and joy um, from being in the presence of the Lord. And so I pray and hope that for all of you over time, that your experience of a Sunday morning is just full of joy and peace. And um, because you have sat under the word of the Lord, experienced the presence of the Lord, remembered the gospel and all the good things the gospel does for us, um, and also conviction, the freedom of conviction. Uh, sometimes we have to be wrecked uh, before we're built back up, and if that happens to you a few times, you start to even be excited about the convicting moments of life. With that said, let's pray. Father, uh, I ask, Lord, for your presence today, uh, the convicting power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that it would settle heavy on our hearts. God, may you be, you yourself, uh, be the one who, who comes in and tears out what is not worthy of you in our hearts. Uh, as Pastor Corey said earlier, what comes out of our mouths comes out of our hearts. 
It doesn't come from anywhere else. And any other kind of ways we have to justify or blame someone else or point the finger at the end of the day, what comes out of us is what was in us. So, Father, as we, we move towards this, this could potentially be a very weighty and convicting thing for many people. I pray and hope, Lord, desperately that it is. But, Father, even on this uh, side of conviction, I pray that people would be holding on to hope, knowing that conviction is good, not because it wrecks us, uh, not because it makes us mourn and grieve, and weep even, but because on the other side of all of that is real healing and real change and real freedom. Uh, living in self-denial about not being so bad is not actually the way we find joy or healing in this world. And, and so God, make us fearless that we might be able to be confronted with your word and just how dastardly bad and wicked we are and then go from there to the cross and go from there to joy. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I want to start uh, this message with a little confession. Um, I am a grumbler, and I have been a gossip. By the grace of God, I grumble less than I used to. And I I'm thankful because if you let grumbling sort of take you over, you'll be miserable and you'll make the people around you miserable and discouraged and disgruntled. I'm thankful that the Lord has done much work in me in this area. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about grumbling. Uh, this week, however, we're going to be talking about gossip. Now, I think it's been a number of years since I've, I've gossiped, and, and when I did gossip, I did not think... Uh, I, I don't think I was aware that I was doing it because I was really good at justifying gossip as care and concern as just and right, and I had other gossiping friends likewise unaware that they were gossipers, and together we, we all thought we were right and other people were wrong, so I want to tell you the story and then walk you through some scriptures about this terrible thing horrible thing, wicked thing called gossip. And it's even worse than that. <laughs> I was 26 years old. I just left seminary and moved from Dallas, Texas to a small church in the Midwest where I served as a college pastor. When I lived in Dallas, I went to the village church. I think we probably had 7,000 members then. The church was geared towards people my age and people with young families. Uh, Matt Chandler preached there, and Pastor Matt, in my opinion, is like in the top 0.001% of gifted preachers in our generation. He's insanely gifted. Our church was very missional, uh, which meant we really went after the lost. Our baptism services were huge, and often we actually had our members baptize the people that were getting baptized. It was such a great thing to see 30 people baptized, and those baptized people share 30 testimonies, but then right along with that, we had 30 other testimonies from people who had led them to Christ, right? And, and these other 30 people, they weren't pastors, right? They were blue-collar, white-collar workers, right? They were normal people that did not have seminary training, right? And the Lord had blessed them and used them. Our church was very communal there. Uh, in fact, you had to be in a small group to become a member, um, and our small group was a family. We met from 6 to 9 p.m. every Sunday night, sometimes later. Our church took membership very, very, very seriously. Uh, becoming a member at our church took months, months and months and months. We had to do classes, we had to have mentors, we had to have a lot of one-on-one -on -one talks, and then at the end of it, we had to sign a very significant covenant making real specific promises about how we were going to be part of building up our church in love, part of equipping and serving within the church itself. And the sermons at the village were amazing. Every time I went to church, I felt like a loser, like I did. And I felt really excited about it. 
right? Because change was possible. Uh, Pastor Matt just had this great ability to bring hopeful conviction. He felt so messed up and so eager to change. And the music guys was amazing. I mean, they actually put out CDs that they sold, right? So we left, and notice what I'm going to do with my hands here. We left that perfect, perfect church and moved to a small Midwestern church, and guess what I did? I played the comparison game. I don't know if any of you have done that before. My new church's pastor was not Matt Chandler. Why I thought he should be, I do not know. Looking back, I was crazy, but I found myself quickly frustrated by his preaching. Uh, to me, the guy sounded like an academic professor. Additionally, the elders seemed to be very suspicious of words like missional or contextual, which, to be honest, few of us even use those words today. Uh, but back then, they were kind of the trendy words for outreach and evangelism. Uh, the church was decidedly inward focused, and I was frustrated because there were lost people out there somewhere going to hell, and we didn't seem like we cared about them. In the first few months at that church, I had repeated headbutts with the pastor and elders, and then seeing that they were not going to listen to me, <laughs> the 26-year-old expert, I started to go silent. You know, I'd listen to them, head nod, and then I'd go do what I wanted anyways and gather with my friends and blast our leaders for being terrible. Uh, did we go to our leaders? No, we talked about them. Did we give them the benefit of the doubt? No, we assumed the worst. Did we question our perspectives on them or the things that we were frustrated about? No, we simply encouraged ourselves to get more entrenched in our own perspectives. Did we help? Did we help the church, or our leaders, or even ourselves? No. We created discouragement, divisiveness, frustration, destruction. One of the young men in our group left our church to plant a competing church in the same town, two blocks away. <laughs> he asked me to come with him, and I said no because I was called to college ministry and I was encouraged by the college ministry. So I was willing to put up with these horrible leaders uh, because I was still getting something that I wanted out of it. And then as I stayed there and battled and had these older men, these elders and pastors confront me again and again, and they were unbelievably patient. I mean, sometimes they would lose their temper with me. Uh, but even there, they were unbelievably patient and treated me with so much more patience than I, I could have ever deserved. And as I had other friends start challenging me in my sin, I, I, I woke up and realized how horrible I was, how disobedient to God I was. And that's the scary thing about this, my brothers and sisters. It's not that we're just good at justifying our sin, <laughs> we're really good at justifying our disobedience to God. So it's been 12 years since then, and still today I look back on this time as one of the most regretful periods of my life. Over the years, I've talked with elders and the pastor and apologized for my sins, and they likewise have apologized for places they were wrong. As I've gotten older, I realized that I was gossiping. You know, I was right in some of what I thought, but I was completely wrong in what I was doing with that rightness. And I did not see the whole picture. I had a small group of people that I cared about, college students and the lost, and I thought everything the church did should be for them. The elders and pastors, on the other hand, realized the church body was so much more than two groups. 
And they did not want to be a church that existed just for mainly two groups. They wanted to be a church where all the groups existed to worship Jesus and love each other. And they were right. And they were right. I'm not sure if my groups have changed much, those that are near to my heart. I still love college students. I, I still want to see the lost saved. Um, I think God stirred my affection for children much more, too. But I do need to lean against being so selective, right, and start judging my church based on what they're doing for my interest groups. And I wonder, if you were honest with yourself, who are your interest groups? And how does sometimes your experience of church and your demands on the church come all about those few little people that you have said are more important than everybody else? I am so thankful that these elders just kicked me out of the way <laughs> and said our church is for the worship of Christ. And we want all people to worship Christ. So who was I back then? Well, I was prideful, very prideful. I was prideful. I looked at the problems that the church had and thought the fixes were easy. If the elders would just do what I said, change would happen, and it would all be positive. And then what happened is that God, in his mercy, gave me the freedom to do things my way. And what happened was my way, my different way, created either the same problems or different problems that were just as bad. I was prideful. I thought my group of friends were the real serious Christians and that the other Christians were posers because they didn't prize what I prized. They saw things differently. I was prideful and angry and didn't acknowledge God's work in the church. Was I right about the fact that they were an inward-focused church? Yes, I was, and that wasn't right, but I was not honest about how good they were at it. You know, never since or before was I at a church that had a community that was so strong. 90% of the church went to Sunday school every week. 90% of the church was involved in a small group every week. Week. Every time we suffered, big or small, the church showed up. You know, and as, as hard as it was going into it, it was actually at this church where my wife and I and our family actually learned what it actually meant to be a church to somebody else, to be brothers and sisters to other people. The church was good at so many things. But all I cared about was what they were bad at. And I had no patience and a lot of wrath, and I spread that wrath to others through gossip. And I thank God that he destroyed me. So I imagine that this is not a completely foreign story for most of you, because I believe grumbling and gossip are some of the most common sins we struggle with, and we've gotten so good at hiding them. So I started things this way because I think this message is quite potentially going to cut some of you really deep in your heart. And I'll be honest, I hope it does. I hope that some of you leave today feeling disgusted with yourselves. I hope that some of you leave today and go home and weep because you realize you've been agents of destruction and division in God's church for years and years and years. I hope that some of you go home and call old pastors and say, I've been so bad to you, forgive me. I hope some of you go home today and call your friends and confess your sins and say to them, this needs to stop immediately. If you get cut to the heart today, I want you to know I'm right there with you. I'm not speaking as someone who is above you, although I'm standing. I'm not speaking as someone who is morally on a higher ground than you, but as someone who struggles. And I feel qualified 
to cut you to the heart, to break you over this, because God has been so good to break me. We really ought to weep and mourn over our sin and then thank Christ that he died for our sin and paid the penalty for our sin. Through Jesus, we can be saved and change. Christ has saved us eternally, and he can also save us from continuing to reap what a life of gossip sows. All right, so all over scripture, we're commanded to make sure that we put grumbling and gossip to death and use our words to build up rather than tear down. So let's start by jumping into James chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 5 through 18. James 3, verses 5 through 18. So also, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth... Come blessing and cursing, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does the spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts. Do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. But one thing worth noticing in this passage is in James 3.15. James 3.15 says that gossip, slander, people cursing, and things like these are demonic. You know, not many sins in scripture are straight up called demonic but let that sink in okay gossip slander people cursing is demonic the seriousness of this sin is also highlighted by verse 6 which says that the arsonist tongue of a gossiper or a slanderer or a people cursor doesn't only set fires but that the arsonist tongue is actually a tool of hell, for the fire started by the arsonist tongue is a fire started by hell. And what is hell hoping to burn down through the tongue of the arsonist gossiper? Verse 6 says, the whole body and all its members. If you give in to gossip, hear this, I told you, I want to cut you to the heart. You need it. I need it. If you choose gossip, you are making yourself a tool of hell in league with demons who desire to burn down the whole church. Pretty intense. That is pretty darn intense. Straight out of James. Brothers and sisters, a church can survive almost any problem that does not threaten the gospel. 
A church can survive almost any imperfection or struggle until the busy body enters the picture. 1 Timothy 5.13 calls people who engage in gossip and slander and things like them busy bodies. A church can survive almost any imperfection or struggle until the busy body enters the picture. And notice it only takes one. Notice in James 3, 5, that it only takes a single tongue, one tongue to set the whole forest that would be the whole church ablaze. We must be committed to putting gossip and grumbling and slander and things like them to death in the church. We must. If we ignore this, our whole church will be set on fire. A couple more texts on this. Proverbs. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps the thing covered. Proverbs 16 says, a worthless man plots evil and his speech is like a scorching fire. A dishonest man spreads strife and a whisperer separates close friends. A man of violence entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. Whoever winks his eye plans dishonest things. He who pursues, purses his lips brings evil to pass. Again, we must be committed to putting gossip, grumbling, slander, and things like them to death in the church. We must, if we ignore this, our whole church will burn. Luke 6.45 says, out of the abundance of our hearts do our mouths speak. Goes right along with what Corey said. So we know that gossip, slander, people cursing, and things like these originate from our hearts. So what are some things that are going on in the hearts of people who have mouths filled with fire? Well, again, James helps us here. Verse 5 says, a tongue filled with fire is concerned with boasting. Verse 14 says, a tongue filled with fire often involves a heart filled with jealousy or selfish ambition, which means this tongue of fire wants to get its way, right? I want to get what I want. I want what they have. I want them to do what I want them to do. I want things to change to suit me or my interest group. Do what I say or get out of my way. Further, jealousy comes from a heart that is ungrateful and discontent. People unhappy with their possessions or their positions in life often look for someone to blame. You know, it's their fault that things are the way they are for me. It's their fault that things are the way they are for people I care about. It's their fault that the sad or bad thing is happening. And oftentimes, whoever's in a leadership position whether it's a boss at work or a parent at home, tends to be who you blame. We can also see what the heart behind a tongue filled with fire is like by simply writing an anti-verse for verse 17 and 18. Okay, so the real verse 17 and 18 says this, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. A harvest of righteousness. Man, we need to be good peace sowers. All right. The opposite then would read like this. But the busybody from below is first impure, then combative, harsh, Closed to reason, full of retaliation and bitter fruits, partial to friends and self-deceived, and a harvest of unrighteousness is sown in strife by those who make strife. So the heart of a person who has a tongue filled with fire may be fixated on revenge, may find the meaning of life in fighting others, and may be tearing down others as a way to justify their own sin. The heart of a person who has a tongue of fire may just want to fit in, though, right? They may just want to be popular or accepted by a certain group of people. This person doesn't even necessarily have the goal of harming or ruining anyone's life, but they'll just do it because they want to be accepted by their friend group. 
Furthermore, the heart of a person who has a tongue filled with fire is not usually interested in the truth. <laughs> not really. If they are interested in truth, they are only interested in certain versions of the truth. That would be versions of the truth that justify them or versions of the truth that fit with what their friends say. You know, it's important that you guys heed the command to be impartial. Okay, that means you do not assume your friend is right just because they're your friend. It's important to heed that command to be impartial while considering Proverbs 18, 17, which says the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him also. You know, and oftentimes if a friend comes to me and throws someone under the bus, my follow-up isn't, oh, well, I'm going to go and talk to them about this. Right? It's, oh, well, my friend said it. Must be true. Gossip thrives in groups that do not question what they hear. Gossip thrives in groups that do not include the people who are being talked about, but exclude them so that the internal narrative can grow and become stronger. A gossip is close to reason and is self-deceived, therefore they really are not interested in truth. They are interested in proving their truth. Now I want to press into the self-deception bit more here because it is very likely that if you are a gossiper, you've found ways to completely justify your gossip. So let me share you some common ways people justify their tongues of fire. First, some justify gossip by calling it care, concern, prayer, love, or wisdom. <laughs> so they might say, please pray for so-and-so, their husband just did such and such. Okay, well, how did you learn that information? And did that woman actually tell you to go around asking people to pray for that? You know, or how about this, oh, that new couple that just came to, right, that family, those members, they're just ruining our church with this and that, the kids are so unruly, blah, 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 whatever it is, right, a busy body is often a person who is either confident in their assumption or unaware that they make assumptions. So instead of starting with reason, which means asking clarifying questions, investigating things, making sure they have the full picture, instead they simply assert what they believe and if the person they are asserting it about denies it, the gossiper is so confident in their assumptions that the only reason they can think of why someone would deny what's obvious to them is because they're either defensive or evil. Can't because it's not true. Okay, second, some justify gossip, slander, and people cursing by claiming it's just the way they are or it is just their personality or that it is just how they grew up, or that it is just the way people communicate where they are from. Okay, brothers and sisters, all of us are born sinners in families of sinners who live in towns where all the residents are sinners. That's just all of us. That's all of us. Right? None of that means that we get to resist repenting of sin. Like, even if you actually are a natural-born gossip with a personality that naturally bends towards cursing people, and even if you had parents who were the same way, even worse, and treated you poorly, and even if they lived in a wider community that was full of tongues of destruction and wrath, that does not justify you to continue in sin. And to say it the bigger way, that does not justify you to disobey God. Your personality <laughs> is never an excuse to disobey God, ever, ever. Okay, so at this point, we have a couple things left to do. Uh, first, I want to give you some ways to recognize when gossip is happening. Second, I want to give you a few rules that will keep you from participating in gossip. Third, I want to help those of you who are thinking, well, hold on a second. If I don't talk about other people, I don't have anything to talk about. <laughs> like, gossip is my entire topic list. 
And fourth, I want to answer a question some of you may be having, which is something like this. Well, how are we supposed to talk about bad things that need to be addressed, right? Like, hi, can't gossip. And then what are, we, what are we supposed to do about the actual bad stuff and bad people and bad things that happen? We'll talk about that too. All right. Okay, so what are some common ways to recognize gossip? Uh, first, the conversation is decidedly negative. It's about someone that everyone in the room loves to hate. <laughs> Very good chance. Second, the conversation is about someone who isn't in the room. Third, the conversation isn't based on proven facts, but instincts and assumptions. And in America, in our education system, it can be very, very hard for some of us to know the difference. <laughs> these opinions and these facts look off to the light. Uh, some common phrases employed at the beginning of gossip are, I don't think so-and-so will mind if I tell you this. Don't tell anyone this, but, hey, have you heard about what happened? Hey, I have a confidential prayer request. Hey, listen, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but, hey, I want to tell you something about so-and-so, but you have to promise not to repeat this to anyone. Right? Okay, how can you avoid gossip? First, talk to someone, not about someone. Right? Talk to someone, not about someone. If you are not talking to the person about the thing you are frustrated with, you really have no business talking to anyone else. Are there exceptions to this rule? Yes, there are. Here they are. If you are in, if you are in an abusive relationship, Okay, where you could be harmed, you can talk to your pastor or a person who can help you right away. Or, if you know someone who is a risk to themselves or others, right, you don't need to talk to that person first. You can talk to your pastor or someone who is in a position to help right away. All right, second, how do you avoid gossip? Only say things that solve problems to people who are in positions to help solve problems. Okay, so if you are not in a position to help, and if what you are saying is to a person who is not in a position to help, you probably shouldn't be sharing and talking about what you're talking about. Okay, third, pray privately instead of venting. And pray for the people you want to vent about or the situations you want to vent about. Pray instead of gossip. Uh, that, that one's been huge for me. Is like when, I, when I'm just furious with people, uh, I can just ruminate for the longest time, think about it, think about it, think about it. But sometimes every once in a while, God comes and slaps me in the back of the head. I love it when he does that. It's like, dude, you're being an absolute moron. <laughs> right? And so I'm like, okay, shoot. Do I really have to pray for these people, right? Because you know what, God? I can't hold on to my anger at them and pray for them at the same time. So it's almost like he knows what he's doing. All right. How to avoid gossip, number four. Ask yourself questions like these. Is what I'm about to say honoring to God? When I say this, Will I be representing Jesus well? Do I have permission to say or share what I'm about to say or share? Is what I'm about to say building up? Does it build up my church? Does it build up this person? All right. So now for those of you wondering, if I do not gossip, then what do I talk about? First, it is a problem, yeah. First, uh, learn to affirm people, okay? Learn to say encouraging things. Uh, buy Sam Crabtree's book, Practicing Affirmation. It's this tiny little book. You can read it just in a, a short little bit of time. And when you feel that desire to rip someone down or vent your frustration or spread hate or ruin reputations, instead say something affirming that builds them up. Get really good at seeing the good in other people. Second, and don't take this the wrong way, but get a life. 
right? Like, read books, take up hobbies, learn about something interesting, right? So that, that like, when you're in a conversation, you're like, anybody ever paint before? Or, you know, just something else, anything else than ripping people down. Uh, third, learn to ask people about themselves. Uh, people who tend to talk a lot <laughs> are also more likely to gossip, right? So learn to listen more. Proverbs 10.19 says, when words are many, transge transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. James 1.19 through 20 says, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Amen. And, and there's another question. What I'm about to say, is, is it primarily anger? <laughs> anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Okay, lastly, but aren't we told to confront our brothers? Yes. And I think most of us probably know the difference between speaking the truth in love to our brother and sister in Christ and gossiping about them to others. So I'm just going to say uh, a little bit on this point. Uh, Matthew 18, 15 through 17 says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So you keep it private at first. Now notice it says, if he sins against you. So this isn't if he does something you don't like, right? If he disagrees with your opinion, if you have a grievance with him that has nothing to do with him being a sinner, but actually everything to do with you being a sinner, if he has a different way of doing things, if he has a different conviction on an unimportant matter, this doesn't cover any of that stuff. Okay, this is specifically about sin, sin done against you. And sin that is significant enough that it has to be addressed. Uh, continuing with the text, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Okay, so notice how different this is than gossip. Other people are involved, but who else is involved? The person you are talking to. And notice also the goal is to gain back your brother. To gain back your brother. If, if you're in a group and you guys have any other goal and you're talking about this person in a negative way other than bringing them back into fellowship, Something has gone widely, widely, widely wrong. And notice what these two or three other people are doing. They're not there to be part of your war party. <laughs> they are there to investigate if what you are saying about the person is actually true. This means that if this happens, you should not be finding people who will just take your word for it but people who will actually say, okay, I understand your concern, but after we talk to the person, I might disagree with your opinion on the matter. Is that okay with you? Continuing with the text, verse 17, if this man refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. So again, these aren't run-of-the-mill sins. These are sins that are significant enough that church discipline is necessary. But notice that at this point, three or four people have actual factual information based on repeated conversations where the truth of the matter has been firmly established. Lastly, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. All right, so none of what we described here is gossip. Okay, gossip is a replacement for this. It's an easy, destructive, horrible, sinful replacement for actually engaging with your brothers and sisters in love. It's just a replacement for love, really. Okay, so that was a lot. And, and like I said, it may have left you feeling rough. My prayer is that the conviction will be a hopeful conviction, like, man, I stink, but I, I'm so excited to change. I can change. 
With that said, I, I want to end by looking at just a few more texts, but these texts are different. These texts tell us how we should talk to each other, how we should talk about one another. All right, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in the sight of the Lord. Let us speak words that are good for building up as fits the occasion, that gives grace to those who hear, that encourage one another and build one another up that mutually sharpen us, that help us progress in our knowledge of the faith and our joy in the faith. Let us speak words that give ample reason to glorify Christ Jesus. Let us weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And let us speak the truth in love that all may grow in Christ. Let's pray. Father, God, I, I pray that as a church, you would make us the enemy of everything that is alien to your gospel, and that through that, as a culture of people, as a church, as a family, that what we value and what we love and how we look and how we act and how we speak stands out with such a contrast to everything else around us. Man, this is an area, isn't it? I don't think I've ever been in a workplace with more than a couple of employees. If it was more than a couple of employees, I, I don't think I've ever been at a workplace where people didn't cut down people, cut down people, cut down people. If we use our words different, if we lead others to use their words different, if we look for things to encourage in people, to affirm in people, if we are constantly asking, how can I build my brother up? How can I build my sister up? How can I build my brother who I'm, I'm frustrated with up? <laughs> how can I build up my sister, right, who's just an energy suck to be around? How can I do that? We will be so utterly, utterly different than the culture around us. Far too often, God, has your church just mixed in with what's around them. Far too often have we not repented fully. God, I pray, Lord, that you would continue to convict us, break us, cause us to weep, and then to turn to you and any depth of remorse <laughs> or shame or guilt that we have, God, the deeper we can feel that, the more amazed and joyful we will be when you take it away from us. He who is forgiven much loves much. We are all forgiven much, but we don't all know that. Help us to know that. And because that's true, help us to be long-suffering, slow to anger, forgiving towards each other, and speak words to build each other up in the same gospel. Amen. We're going to take the Lord's Supper together. Now, as I was preparing uh, for this morning, uh, knowing the text of Scripture that we would be sitting under this morning, thinking about words and uh, how I've used words in the past and how I might feel sitting under uh, this text, um, I couldn't help but think of another one that leads perfectly into what we're about to do here. You know, when, you're, when your job is like 90% words, you sit under a text like James 3 and be really scared to ever use words again. <laughs> um, but this passage came to my mind, and I thought this is appropriate for, for communion today in light of James 3, and it goes like this from John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. 
in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So maybe you're thinking this morning about the many things you've said with your tongue and how easily your tongue can be in fire. And you're thinking about how you've used your words and maybe feeling some regrets right now. And there's a couple of options you have. You can deal with those regrets in several different ways. You could just let yourself be discouraged and crushed under the weight of regret, be full of self-pity about it. You could resolve that you're just going to do better and you're going to try harder and not use your words in a destructive way. You could do that, but you could also do this. This is what I would recommend. You could remember that when our words, when what was coming out of our hearts and out of our mouths was enough to condemn us in God's sight, God sent His word to save. Not only did He send His word to save, His word was his only son. John teaches us this, that it's actually appropriate to think of Jesus as the word of God, to think of Jesus as the way in which God has supremely and finally spoken and communicated himself and made himself known and understood. The son of God is the very word of God to you, saving word, a forgiving word. Forgiveness for all our sinful words. And so we remember that when we take the supper, when we take the bread and the cup. It also says in John 1 that the Word became flesh and lived among us and made His home among us. And on the cross, He gave up that body of flesh to the wrath of God in your place. He came and He took on a body with human lifeblood in it so that your blood would not have to be spilled to satisfy God's justice against your sin. And He offered up His own to cover your sin. So today, we take these things to remember that body, to remember that blood. I'm going to invite the servers to come forward now as we think about each of these elements. In a moment, we're going to pass these things. We're going to pass a cup with a bread, a piece of bread, and we're going to pass a cup filled with juice. And as we take the bread, we're going to remember the body of Christ that was given up in our place for the justice of God that we should have received. And we're going to take the cup and remember His blood like a sacrifice that covers up our sin. And this doesn't work if Jesus isn't perfect. That, that's the whole point, that this is offered up in our place, that His blood, His life covers our lives. And so when Jesus looks on you, He sees His own Son and is pleased. So I'm going to pray right now. And um, as I pray, the servers are going to grab the trays and start working through the room. And when I say amen, they'll start serving you. And your job is just to remember and receive. Let's pray. Father and God, as, uh, as we're getting ourselves ready to receive these elements, I pray that we would remember the good done to us by Jesus, we would remember all of this is gift. All this is grace. If, uh, if you're not sure about your relationship with the Lord this morning, it would be good just to let these elements pass you by and talk to the Lord as these things are going on. Ask Him to open your eyes to His glory and grace. But if your eyes are already open and you know that you belong to Jesus, then it would be good to take these things 
remember and receive his grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we read in the Gospels that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. We read also that he took the cup in the same way. And he said, this is my blood of the covenant given to you for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink all of it. Let's give thanks to God. Lord Jesus, you are our life. You are our forgiveness. You are our acceptance. You are our righteousness. You are wisdom. You are our hope. You are our future. You are everything to us. All glory be to Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.